everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. I'm excited for today's video. It's going to be talking about a subject that I really haven't heard talked about before, and uh, that is about the potential for falconry to have been historically and prehistorically in the New World. Whether or not that's even a possibility, and if so, what's our evidence, and if not, uh, why? Why it would not have emerged here? Uh, before we do, though, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. It really does help me with this channel. And be sure to let me know down below in the comments what you think of this video and what more you'd like uh, talked about on this channel. Now, falconry is rich. It's, it's the heritage, the history worldwide is rich. It's, it's, a, it's a worldwide sport. It's very much a human experience. People all over have done it since ancient times. It's usually regarded as the oldest field sport practiced by the human species. It predates archery, it predates uh, horsemanship in most areas. And so really, uh, it's, it's, it's ancient. And in the areas where it's been practiced, you, most areas it has this rich history going back, going back, going back. I am in the United States. Uh, my ancestors were uh, Sami reindeer herders from Scandinavia. And uh, as far as I know, there's no uh, ancient history of falconry there. And so growing up here in the United States, falconry here really isn't more than 100 years old. And I mentioned this in a recent video, most people growing up in the United States, our intro to falconry is through Western European um, history, right? Like medieval falconry, Renaissance falconry, a knight in shining armor, and they're carrying their hawk. Uh, for me, what really hit me was Middle Eastern falconry, Arabian falconry. As a young child, the concept of, whoa, hunting bustards with saker falcons out in the sand dunes just, just to me, is the most romanticized, personally, version of falconry, Arabian falconry. Love it. Uh, but we didn't have this, this long history, this long tradition here in the United States. And so, uh, but still, falconry is proliferated throughout the New World. Uh, when I I say New World, I mean South America, Central America, Mexico, United States, Canada. New World, New World, right? Uh, the New World, falconers in all of those uh, continents, <laughs> all those regions, practice falconry of the highest caliber to, to this day. Like today, it's very big. You can go all through those areas and find falconers practicing game hawking, doing their thing. But I want to talk about in ancient times. In ancient times, was there falconry? in the new world. So falconry, I'm talking about hunting, pursuing game, you're taking a trained raptor, you're building a relationship of trust and then letting them go do what comes natural to them, which is to hunt. And that is something to be put into question. Now, I have a background in archaeology and anthropology in addition to biology. So I love studying cultures, especially ancient cultures. And when we do that, it's, it's like a detective work. Uh, not all the answers are there. If there's written history, it's being told by the person writing. So what's their angle? What's their spin? What's their belief system? Uh, and, and, and what's important to them? What's not important to them? So a person documenting, maybe if they don't give a darn about falconry, they're not going to put that in their history. And my people practiced falconry. And vice versa. Uh, maybe if they do care about it, they're going to focus on it. And you think that some region that falconry is all that mattered. Well, in the new world, by the way, the word history comes from historia, which means writing. So when we say, what does history say? Or prehistoric, prehistoric means before writing. So prehistoric times are not the same all over the world. It, it's at what point was writing documenting what was happening in that region and different areas that's different times and you could have prehistoric then historic and if writing is lost in an area you're back to uh non-historical again and then historic that's important when i'm throwing these terms around that you understand that but the new world we do not have officially any solid evidence or proof that game hawking that falconry in the form of game hawking occurred in the new world. Something that's cut and dry that we can say, yes, for sure, look, here it was. We do have, in my opinion, four cases to give argument. Now, uh, whether or not there was or was not, that's up to still be determined. And we know it's practice now. But the world we live in now is very different than the ancient world as far as food, as far as obtaining food, as far as providing food for our birds, uh, refrigeration, 
<laughs> captive bred birds to feed, like buying captive bred quail, putting them in a freezer, shipping them, putting them in a freezer at your house, thawing them out in a refrigerator. Uh, that kind of world didn't exist anciently anywhere. And that needs to be factored in. So four cases, really, there's four cases that I say give an opportunity for discussion of whether or not there could have been falconry in the ancient New World. The first one is about the oldest. There was an archaeological dig that took place in coastal Alaska where uh, native tribes there had lived and inhabited this area that had a village, a coastal village. They didn't live there anymore, but it was excavated. And in the excavation, several jeer falcon skeletons were uncovered. Now, this is interesting for many reasons. These skeletons were articulated, meaning they were whole. So when these birds died or were buried, they were laid whole. Okay, no taking apart. And on some of them, they're, they, well, all of them looked very healthy. The bone structure, the bone density, the beak, the talons, everything looked that these birds were in very good health. So that could be, that could mean several things. Uh, some of them looked as though there was some uh, um, um, indentation as though there might have been some sort of restraint like Jess's on the legs, but that's it. We don't have anything beyond that at the site. The weird thing is it dates back to about 7,000 years old. So this seems to indicate the keeping of deer falcons in some way. Now this does not mean falconry. This doesn't mean hunting. So here's some of the theories. Some people have speculated, well, they were eating them. It's a possibility, but I don't agree with that at all because again the skeletons were entirely whole and they were articulated they were not disarticulated and when you butcher i do experimental archaeology demonstrations for archaeologists and let them film how to butcher with stone tools and you can tell there's telltale marks when you butcher an animal on the bones when those bones are fresh uh there are slice marks and cut marks and abrasions when you're uh getting as much material off as you can none of that is there uh, so everything indicates these birds were not eaten. Uh, some have suggested they could have been sacrificed. Like they, and that is possible. They, they, if, if there was some sort of ritual offering, they could have been uh, killed and, and, and dispatched in a way that left no marks on the bones and then buried in a way that was, uh, you know, respectful. They could have been kept just as uh, alive as some sort of spiritual purpose in the village. And then when they died of old age, buried respectfully. Those are possibilities as well. Regardless, here's the strange thing about it. We take for granted uh, today, you know, how much it takes to upkeep a bird. If you live in the Arctic, you are burning through calories like crazy. Uh, any animals you have, if you have dogs, they're burning through calories too. Food is a premium. And so you do not waste food. And so if you are keeping a bird of prey for any reason, for any length of time, and you're taking the effort to provide protein to those shear falcons, you better have a darn good reason. Even if it's not falconry, you better have a darn good reason. Now, even if this is not game hawking, this is a very early date to have humans for who knows how long of a period of time keeping uh, falcons in captivity and looking after their care. So there has to be some knowledge of weight management, uh, nutrition, uh, equipment, upkeep for them to have been buried in such healthy conditions. So that's our first one. It's kind of on the fringe there. Don't know what it means, but it's worth noting and worth discussing. The second one um, is something that carries on to this day, and that is in the Amazon basin and going up into Central America, but especially in the Amazon. There is a tribal tradition among many of the tribes there of keeping animals. Now, it's something akin to pets, but a lot of these are orphaned animals, and there is a spiritual element to it. There is a rightness to it of, like, we are kin, we're family. Oh, this monkey was orphaned. Hey, we're going to raise it, keep it in the village. Or, hey, there's, here's this uh, jungle porcupine. Hey, we're, we're taking care of it, we're feeding it. And they're sharing food with these animals. This is included raptors, jungle, dense rainforest raptors, even up to and including harpy eagles, 
which you think about keeping a harpy eagle in a village if you're just a village of hunter-gatherers and you're keeping a harpy eagle. Well, again, that could be a very prominent and spiritual presence. It could be dramatic. Uh, but again, there's upkeep. There's equipment that you have to do. There's, you know, what are you doing to protect your arm if you're moving this, this harpy eagle anywhere? What are you doing to feed it? How are you feeding it? How are you managing that? So we current Amazonian tribes have no documented history of practicing falconry, but they currently do still keep raptors in these uh, rainforest uh, villages and have a uh, verbal history that they've done this all along and in their stories as well. So again, not necessarily falconry, but this is a springboard from, for discussion, but also from which falconry could have or may uh, develop from. Because again, the management keeping and understanding of how they work, how a raptor works, or are you flying them at all? Those kind of things. It's not falconry, but it's a, it's a, it's a point of discussion. The next one is a little further north. Uh, and that would be in parts of, of, of northern, northwestern Mexico and the southwestern United States, where you have Puebloan tribes, ancestral Puebloan tribes, uh, and, and modern ones as well. There was a very rich tradition of taking a raptor, usually as a baby. Typically, it would be a golden eagle or a ferruginous hawk. Could be other species too, but uh, as far as our documentation of it, it's usually those species. Ferruginous hawk or a golden eagle. And having a tethered system, jesses of some kind, and having it be above the pueblo or above the village. And it might have an enclosure at night as well, but basically it lives above the village. It is fed, it is cared for. Now in some tribes, both ancient and modern, it was just, this is, you live here, you're with us, okay? You're here for ritual, spiritual, ceremonial reasons. Uh, for some, it's a, a bird that at a certain age is sacrificed as, as a ritual sacrifice. In some, it is kept for a while and then set free ceremonially. In some, it is kept, and then as the feathers are molted, those are ritual offerings given back. Like, hey, we are giving to the eagle, here's food, um, and you are giving these sacred feathers back that are very important to us. Different purposes, again, every tribe throughout time is going to have a different version of what this means, and the tribe in front of you who is practicing that would be the one to explain exactly what it means to them here and now. But the point is, we have uh, historic uh, at 1800s for sure. We know it goes further back, but 1800s on uh, through today, we have this tradition. And we know from sites such as Chaco Canyon, Mimbres Valley, Pacume in northern, northern Mexico, we know that they, they're, that birds were kept. They understood how to keep and breed macaws, scarlet macaws and military macaws. Uh, we know they kept, bred, and domesticated several species of turkeys. But in addition, there was this tradition from the wild of wild eagles and wild ferruginous hawks being kept and cared for. This, again, there are tribes who still do this today and have permits issued to allow for this. This is interesting. And again, this isn't falconry, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't have been practiced in some form somewhere in the ancient southwestern United States or northwestern Mexico. It could have. But this is different because this is an agrarian way of life. My example in Alaska, hunter-gatherers. Uh, my example in the Amazon, hunter-gatherers. Uh, Puebloan cultures and Puebloan tribes, peoples, are agrarian and rely very heavily on, on agriculture, on growing several specific crops. They do hunt and they will eat, you know, turkeys and certain domesticated animals as well. But largely, it's agricultural. So if you're in a desert, in a desert, resources are slim pickings. It is hard to find uh, protein. And if you're mostly relying on plants as well as wild plants, cacti, agave, yucca, things like that, an eagle cannot eat those things. So any protein you have is a premium, is very rare, very valuable, very costly, and cannot be stored. Hot, dry, things rot fast, or they dry out. No refrigerator, no freezer, no, I would like to order some uh, caternic quail to feed my bird. To do this is a big deal. 
It's it's very big deal. And people don't think about that. We're like, oh yeah, it just is a footnote in some book. And some of these tribes would keep eagles, you know, tethered up above their Pueblo. You, you want to elaborate on that? Because that's huge. Uh, all three of these examples I've given. Now, in the rainforest, hyperproductive rainforests of South America, of course, food is more available in some ways. So maybe it's not as hard to feed your pet harpy eagle. But in the deserts of the American Southwest and Northwestern Mexico, yes, it, food is a premium. Uh, protein is a premium. So again, we do not know if actual falconry is practice. It hasn't been documented, and we don't have an oral tradition that it's ever been shared. But it is possible that in that southwestern United States, northwestern Mexico, that some form of falconry regionally could have emerged. That is definitely possible and worth consideration, worth discussion, and worth research if perhaps some Pueblo does have a tradition of that and was willing to share that. The fourth point of, uh, of, of history that or prehistory of contending for there being falconry in the New World comes out of Mesoamerica, uh, northern uh, you know, the Yucatan Peninsula and uh, all the way to central Mexico. We have empires such as the Mayan Empire, the Aztec Empire, the Chichimecas, and, and many, a Zapotec. A lot of these empires and these cultures had a, a rich history of revering birds of prey and many other birds as well, but especially birds of prey. The Aztecs, of course, as a symbol, have the symbol of the eagle with a snake on top of a cactus as a, a symbol of their empire and their people, and even their origin story of how they came to where they came to be. That is usually today touted as being a golden eagle perched on a cactus, but we actually have a number of reasons to think the bird it was was actually a crested caracara. Uh, I will actually probably go into depth on that in another video since it's a research area of passion for me. But birds of prey, highly, um, highly important to these ancient empires. But here's the interesting thing. We, again, we don't have any records of falconry per se, but we do have a very interesting story that connects Europe, Renaissance Europe, with the Aztec Empire and with Mesoamerica in a very unexpected way. Now we have Master Falconer Jim Nelson to thank for this research coming to the forefront of the falconry community. I will put a link in the video down below to his page with all his research. If you find this subject interesting, uh, of this particular point, uh, let me know down in the comments because I've pondered making a video specifically on this and maybe even interviewing Jim on, more on his research he's done and his journey finding this. But basically, when you had conquistadors and Spanish coming to the New World, one of the things they encountered was that uh, Aztec royal courts and, and groups had birds of prey present. And there is reason to think that we had two, particularly the Harris Hawk, and the Aplomato Falcon. Now, what's interesting about this? We have records that in the 15 and 1600s, the Spanish were acquiring and shipping across the ocean what they called an Aleth Falcon. And they would ship these that were just the rage of Europe. They were hard to come by. People would buy them on the docks. The second the ship showed up and, and you're like, oh, they wanted to buy them. And they trained them and flew them on Hungarian partridge is what they were hunting. So it was a small falcon. All the descriptions, especially after, if you read Jim's research, you'll see like clearly this Aleth falcon is referring to the Aplomato falcon, which is an amazing species. And, okay, great, really interesting history. So, New World Falcons, Spanish shipping them over, people buying them on the docks, the royalty of Europe, especially in France, they were a big hit. People were flying Aplomato Falcons in France on Hungarian partridges. All right, moving on. No, I don't think so. Not just moving on. You can't just dismiss that. That is a whole whopping huge, huge, huge amount of information there that that brings up some really big questions. First of all, where were the Aztecs getting the Aplomatos from? Were they trapping them? Were they raising them for babies? Why did they have them? Why did they have any knowledge of acquisition of Aplomato falcons? Were they doing falconry? 
How were they maintaining them? This is, again, Aztec. You, it, by the way, if you do any in-depth research of the southwestern United States Puebloan tribes I told you about earlier, they are interwoven like nothing else with Mesoamerica. So anything happening in New Mexico and Mexico, Arizona, southwestern United States, uh, southwestern Utah, southwestern Colorado, hugely intertwined. It's easy to be to separate that, but hugely intertwined. The shipping, the trade, they're trading back and forth, cacao beans, religious ideas, copper bells, live macaws. We find uh, woven feather sashes in northern Utah, woven out of macaw feathers that are 1,100 years old. We find, so it's, they're intertwined. Knowing that, just like these ancient Puebloan tribes, Mesoamerican uh, cultures are also agrarian, grand agrarian cultures with amazing step pyramids and palaces. and and But they're mostly living off of crops and they're living in these extremely hot environments. So yes, they have protein. Yes, they're eating turkeys. Yes, they're hunting deer. Uh, they're hunting parrots and eating all kinds of birds, eating toucans and things in the forest. But protein's hard to come by, just like it is for the Puebloan tribes. So what are you doing keeping Aplomato falcons? How are you feeding them? How are you giving them fresh meat every single day without a refrigerator or a freezer? Are you keeping domesticated turkey chicks to feed them? Don't know. Wasn't documented. Uh, how were they held? Anybody who's ever worked with Aplomato falcons know Aplomato falcons uh, are delicate more so than a lot of other falcons. They're, they're gangly and lurpy. They can easily uh, damage a leg. They easily damage feathers. So how are they keeping, keeping them? Are they using perches? What do they look like? Are they using gloves? What did an Aztec glove look like? Do they have jesses? I would kill to, I would do anything to be like, oh, there had to be some sort of husbandry that was New World specific and bam, Central Mexico, if you want to say New World, if you go Central Mexico to Canada, Central to Mexico to Argentina, that's the dead center of the New World where on its own, whatever equipment they used came from themselves. There's no influence. Oh, you're doing Falcon in your country? Oh, we're going to pick that up. Oh, we're going to do our own version. No, it's just whatever they were doing to keep and maintain these Aplomato Falcons totally independent from the rest of the world, 100%. I would kill to see, to know. Nobody documented it. We don't know if they were hunting with them, but they had acquiring, they had the ability to acquire, keep and maintain enough Aplomatos to ship them when the Spanish would be like, we want these, we're and shipping them over to Europe. That's stage one. What was going on with that? I wish I knew. And that is a contender for falconry. If you've ever worked with Aplomatos, I love them, but they're they're not like other falcons. Now, the ancient Egyptians, we know, uh, did a thing where they kept, long before Arabian falconry was a thing, they pioneered the husbandry of falcons with lanner falcons. We know this, of course, because uh, it's documented in their temples in the Karnak Temple Complex. To honor the god Horus, they learned how to keep and maintain Lantern falcons. Now, a good lantern falcon is like, hey, I'm I'm trained, okay. I'm here to honor Horus. You're giving me food, okay. They're not high strung. Aplomatos are. <laughs> I'm an aplomato falcon. <laughs> They're flipping out, okay. You you're not keeping an aplomato on hand just for ceremony. They could have, but it meant that the Aztecs knew something. They knew something about animal husbandry and falconry techniques. Even, they may have been hunting with them, but maybe they weren't. Maybe they were flying them to a lure. I would kill to know this. That's step one. Step two of this story that I really want to know, it's not like the Spanish were bringing falconers with them to the new world. Oh, I'm a falconer from Spain here to uh, help acquire a bunch of uh, Aplomato falcons and to oversee their health and safe journey over to Europe. No, you get soldiers and sailors and diplomats. Like, they don't know how to upkeep a falcon. So that's part two. How on these tiny wooden boats, cramped wooden boats going back over to Europe across the Atlantic Ocean, how on earth were these birds upkept? 
What perches would they have on? What equipment did they have on? Did the Spanish use Spanish falconry equipment on them? Did they use hoods? Uh, did they, was there Aztec equipment that they brought with them that is lost to history? Don't know. Wish we knew. How were they feeding them? How were they feeding them fresh meat and protein? Anybody who's flown a bird knows how delicate they are and how delicate the weight management on a tiny falcon is like an apomato. So to, how do you keep them fat and happy on that long, dangerous journey? Don't know. And then, boy, wouldn't you just kill to see a painting of a Renaissance, uh, you know, lord or lady or whatever, wealthy person in Europe with a New World Oplomato Falcon on their fist and a Hungarian partridge or something. Oh, if we ever got a painting like that, it'd just be mind-blowing. To In the Renaissance, no, you have these Oplomato Falcons, which they were calling Elites, making it over to Renaissance France. Just mind-blowing. It really is. Uh, that whole story there is a contender for there having been falconry, and in my opinion is the best argument that something akin to falconry did blossom in the New World, independent of anyone or anything else. Can't prove it, at the moment can't disprove it. I would love to research more, and I would love to know more of what other people have to say. We're not done though, because South America, Central America, Mexico, United States, Canada is a whopping big, huge area with deserts, with mountains, with prairies, with tundra, with hyperproductive rainforests, uh, uh, coastlines, everything. Why don't we have falconry blossoming all over the place here like it did in other parts of the world? I will tell you my theory, and I think it's a darn good theory. In the rest of the world, most of the areas that have been settled by the human species we have hunted and animals have learned to be afraid of us and we've hunted and we kill off the megafauna and then we're hunting a smaller prey and then as the ice age the pleistocene uh wanes and loses grip and the world's warming up then suddenly okay hey we can we can hunt small prey regularly and then we switch to agriculture and we're not relying on hunting so there's this layer of stripping more and more deeper 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 resources from a region and of Animals and humans, both wild and domesticated animals and humans, interacting and uh, changing each other, how they interact, what they do. The New World is basically the last, you know, major place for humanity to go to. Uh, you know, and how and when exactly that happened is 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 a hot topic. You know, talking about Clovis culture, Folsom culture, those kind of things. But what we do know is that around the end of the Pleistocene, the New World began to be colonized by the people who are the native peoples of the Americas of today. Now, all these peoples coming in, we know they hunted. We know that they used uh, spears and atlatls and Clovis points and hunted megafauna. They were entering a world with six different species of woolly elephant. You know, woolly mammoth, steppe mammoth, Colombian mammoth, gomphothere, platybelodon, and mastodon. Uh, six different species of bison. Fourteen different species of antelope. Uh, horses, zebras, camels, llamas. Two of these ancient camels were as tall as giraffes. One of them had saber teeth. Uh, giant ground sloths. Some of them, like Megatherium, as big as an elephant. The uh, giant armadillos the size of a Volkswagen bug. And all of these things, all these species had no uh, background with humanity. They didn't know what a human was. And I've had a chance to have a small taste of that from time to time. Well, first of all, you go to Yellowstone, animals are used to us, but you can just walk up to a buffalo. You can just walk up to a coyote, right? Uh... Uh, the area I grew up in, our western desert, used to not have people go out in it. And as a teenager, when my friend and I would go out there, you could walk right up to the antelope. And they're like, what are you? Because a lot of these antelope had never seen a human. We were so far out in the desert. And same thing, if you have a year when rabbits are born and they haven't encountered human hunters yet, you walk up. I, there was a time I just picked up a cottontail rabbit. And I'm like, this is a baby rabbit. But I'm like, uh, okay, as a teenager, I'm like, this is odd. And the, the natural, animals aren't naturally wary of humans necessarily. And you had 
multiple continents in the New World where that was the case. Food was just standing there. Which is better? It, we, we forget the fact that falconry came about not as a hobby, not as a, I'm passionate about birds, not as a status symbol. Oh, I'm aristocracy. I have this species of falcon. It was none of that. It came about originally as a, as a way to get food, a more effective way to get small game, upland game, waterfowl. That's what it came about for. We forget that. So many falconers I know, when they hunt, they don't even eat what they catch. And they're disconnected from that. But there wasn't need for that in the New World because there was just so many species of megafauna that had no experience with humans and their numbers were over the top. You walk up and kill something, stab it, stab, home, okay, you know. You kill some, you know, longhorn bison, bison latifrons, 12 foot wide horns. It's like, hi, stabity stab. Uh. Well, that's going to feed you guys for a long time. A lot more than I'm going to get a falcon and I'm going to learn, develop equipment and I'm going to train it to kill a duck. Okay, so you spent weeks or months training and developing falconry to kill a duck. <sighs> okay, there's your happy meal. Tomorrow you got to get more food. Makes more sense to hunt this readily available megafauna. So same thing. We don't see falconry uh, coming about in other areas where you have a same situation. Take a look at uh, Madagascar. Madagascar, uh, there was tons of megafauna. The people who came there, it's like, hey... We can kill the elephant birds. We can hunt the much larger giant lemurs. We don't need to take the few raptors here and develop that. New Zealand, uh, when the Maori come there, uh, there's all these birds and there was birds of prey, a few like New Zealand falcon, right? Uh, but it's like, hey, there's these moas, these 10, 15 foot tall giant flightless birds that are not afraid of humans. You just go up, stabity stab, bam, your food. There's no reason for falconry to come about when you have food that easily, okay? And same thing, Australia. Uh, you know, Australia has uh, many raptor species that would be fabulous for uh, falconry in the ancient world, but there was no reason to because when the first uh, Aboriginal Australians arrived and began to colonize Australia, the megafauna was just like North America. Uh, there weren't elephants there, but there was the cool things. There was giant wombats, diprotodon, the size of a minivan. There were there were there were short-faced kangaroos. There were kangaroos with antlers. There's so many. There was a, a giant uh, goose thing called Jenny Ornis that was flightless. There were just these uh, huge animals. You get a spear, you get an atlatl. Dinner. We're eating. Why do we need to learn to take a falcon or a hawk? And, and use it to hunt small game. The big game is everywhere, and the big game is not afraid of us. This was true from Canada to Argentina, and whatever order that was settled in is argued by archeologists, but we know that it was happening around the end of the Ice Age onward. And so in my mind, humanity in any form has not been in the new world long enough to necessitate something like falconry coming about as a means to acquire dwindling resources and to go after small game. There's not an advantage anciently in the new world to go after small game with a trained raptor when big game was so much easier. Now, you wouldn't say the same thing. You do those same time periods. Uh, hunting big game in uh, Europe at those same time periods was hard because thousands of years of, of being hunted, it's like, hey, you know what? There's grouse, there's ducks, there's herons. Yeah, if we can get a duck every day throughout the winter, that's great. That's a good meal since it's so much harder to get close to a Irish elk or a, you know, whatever, uh, European bison. It's hard. And so that makes sense why the rest of the world falconry comes about. Uh, that is my theory currently. And I'm fine if it's wrong, but I think it's a good working theory. Now, again... I would really be excited to know if somewhere in the new ancient New World falconry did come about. And again, my personal opinion is Mesoamerica would be the place where it most likely to have been. Um, and I, if you have any scientific reports, surveys, papers that you are aware of that give more information on that, please let me know down in the comments and let all of us share and discuss it because I think it's a fascinating topic. Uh, but either way, I hope you found this video of some interest. Again, it's a topic I'm passionate about. Let me know down below any comments you have. 
And please let me know also if the subject specifically of uh, Jim Nelson's research finding out about the Aleth, the uh, Aplomato being used in the New World, is something that you think is worthy of its own video, let me know and I will dig deeper and make that happen. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. And my friends, as always, happy hopping.